Thanks, Catherine. That's very kind. Uh, lovely introduction. And good afternoon to you all. I hope you've enjoyed your day so far. How about this great event, huh? Yeah. Yeah, so um, thank you for stopping by to listen to me platter on about something that's so near and dear to my heart and has shaped the way that my career has gone. Um, but in order to do so, I don't want to talk about me. I want to talk about someone else. Now, this is not because the slides are really old and my hair was different back then, but, but actually it's because that is not me. You see, in order to understand this, we're going to go a little bit in the past, about six years in the past, and I want to introduce you to a good friend of mine, and his name is Ramon. So there you can see him working happily on his computer. Uh, Ramon, why don't you go ahead and say hello to the nice people on the stage? Very nice. And uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, Ramon? You'll have to forgive him. He's a little shy. But uh, Ramon, don't let that uh, steer you wrong. Ramon is happy. He's been freelancing for a few years now, mainly in um, working on Mac software and also doing some Ruby on the side. And he's been, uh, after a few years of doing this, he's been feeling a little bit... Uh, in Spanish, we say inquieto. It's like restless. Yeah, restless. That's it. And, you know, he's been hearing about events and conferences and Rails girls and, and, and other kinds of initiatives. And he, and he wants to participate, but he's a quite self-conscious fellow. And, you know, he, he went to his first ever meetup, which was a Mac programmers meetup. And when he got there, he felt completely out of place. There were these, all these people with big bushy beards talking about which editor is better and the, uh, Vim and who knows what and Ramon just got really intimidated. Took one step in, oh, it wasn't German by the way. He lives in Austria and he's, German is not great. So he just kind of stepped back in, went home to his hobbit hole and felt really bad about himself. So then he gave it another piece of thought and he thought, okay, maybe, maybe I'm not ready to contribute to the big leagues but what if I can introduce people to programming? So Ramon and his at the time girlfriend, now wife, uh, went to his old high school and said, could I teach your children to code? And fortunately they said yes. So we started this after school activity called computer game programming. And the school was really nice to lend us their children to experiment on. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, it, it was really cool because this is the International School of Vienna. You had kids from all over the world. Um, and the, 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 the diversity was fantastic to work with. There were some years where we had more girls than boys, which was really nice to see. And their imagination is off the charts. My favorite game that one of them made was this game where you played as this space um, ferret saving the universe from the evil lobsters. It's, you gotta see it, it was awesome. So well, when, when, when we started this activity, Ramon thought to himself, okay, I'm, hello all the kids, here's what I want you to learn. I want to teach you to be hackers. And the kids start giggling amongst each other, talking about getting into each other's Facebook or there was no Snapchat at the time, I think. Um, getting into each other's Facebook and messing around and posting photos or lewd messages or something like that. And Ramon explained to them, but when I mean hackers, I don't mean the guy in a business suit with a ski mask. That's not what I meant. I want to teach you to be thinkers. I want you to be inventive. I want you to solve problems in your own creative way. Because at the end of the day, that's what a hack is, isn't it? So, the way we did this, if you're interested, was with a C++ and Ruby programming tool called Gosu, which if you haven't tried it out, I really recommend it. It's a lot of fun, lets you hit the ground running and make games like that. So Ramon at the time, and in, in his infinite wisdom, thought to himself, okay, research? Pfft, no. <laughs> and he jumped in head first, not know, having done no research on pedagogy or anything like that, and he ran into some trouble. Who would have thought? His first big challenge was just having an after-school activity can be pretty tough. The kids are tired. They've been stuffed in their heads with maths and, and history and English and German and so many more um, topics that uh, coding can be a pretty daunting after-school activity, right? And it's, I only had them for one hour a week. And you, it's 
you know, having one hour a week can be pretty tough. A lot of you give them a lot of knowledge. The next week they come back, they've remembered very little about it. And you think, well, why don't you give them homework? You really think I'm going to give homework to a bunch of cool uh, kids at an after school activity? <laughs> I couldn't do that. And so, well, as time went on, Ramon discovered that, um, you know, the way the after her school activities worked at my old high school was that um, halfway between the year you could uh, switch. You, you had the option to switch after school activities. So during the winter semester, from August to January, was just fine. Everybody was happy to be inside. But in summer, it was time for sports. It was time for other activities. Maybe some kids even discovered that they didn't like programming all that much. And at the beginning, that just used to tear me up inside because I thought, have I failed them? Did I, did I ruin that opportunity to get into a wonderful career or, or mindset or, or hobby? And after giving it some thought and after seeing it for a few years, I discovered that it's not really so much that I failed them, I mean, or not at all, but it's also that I've probably just planted a tiny little seed in there that could soon blossom, be it in the form of um, even at, at your accounting job, doing some automation scripts and becoming the best person in the office, or, or you know, doing websites for a living, or, or on the side even, you know, making your portfolio look great. And, and I actually discovered this firsthand this year when one of the students I used to teach came up to me and said, Ramon, I, I want to follow your path. I want to become a software developer. Where can I go to uni? And this, it just, I was so touched. It, it felt like something new to me. And I, I, and I found that um, teaching these kids not only taught them, but it also taught me. And I picked up some skills that I still, to this day, use as a software developer to be a better team member. For those curious, I forgot to mention, uh, the ages I taught were between 9 and 14. Now, these skills I've broken down into five parts to be nice and concise for today. The first of which is, the first of which is about breaking stuff. Because one skill that I have lost, that I used to have as a child, and child's, children have this wonderful skill of breaking stuff. Also, let me tell you some stories. When we were making some games, one game I started them with was a little spaceship game. You're in space, you're flying around, you're dodging asteroids. And so I would t teach them how to do this, and the children would ask me, Ramon, what's a good speed for me to set on the asteroids? And I'm like, well, that's a great question. Uh, maybe like 60 meters per second, you know, 100 meters per second. And they would start telling me, Ramon, my game's not working. I wonder why. They've set the speed really, really high. <laughs> so, another example. Maybe we had, a, 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 we had a little game where you're jumping around, something like Super Mario Brothers or something, and they would ask me, Ramon, how many, how many monsters should I have on the screen at one time? And I thought, I thought, yeah, tell them four, maybe five, thinking to myself, okay, I've, I've caught you this time. You're going to put something like 10, aren't you? No. <laughs> it turned out to be a lot more than that. In that same game, they would ask me, Ramon, what's a good uh, jumping force to put on my character? How high should he be able to jump? And well, I mean, at this point, you get the idea, right? So at the beginning, this kind of used to give me a lot of anxiety. And I think to myself, like, what am I doing wrong? Why? They're, you know, they're not getting the games done. They're not having a, something able to have you know, instantaneous gratification from. They don't have something to take home to their parents. We should have a functioning game. But you know, after giving it a lot of thought, I thought to myself, you know what, this is actually pretty cool because it starts, having, it starts creating conversations. Children ask to themselves, you know, what's going on with my game? Why, why can't I put 10,000 enemies on screen? And they start learning. It slows the computer down. They start realizing in the games they play today that when too much stuff is going on, their, their, frame, dro their frame rate drops or the game becomes a little slower to play. And it reminded me how important it is to just mess around, you know, have a good time, um, try something new, jump into a new framework, see how it ticks, break it. You know, that's important to have. So let's talk, about, let's talk about the things I take for granted, which unfortunately, as uh, happens to a lot of us, as we have become better software developers, we've forgotten how to learn those things. I'll give you an example. Ru uh, warning, Ruby code coming ahead. 
So here's a variable I tell them. I've assigned to it the value of the name Anna. And I'm going to call the command to print that, the value of that name. So I ask the kids, what's going to happen? And they tell me, well, it's going to print out Anna. Correct, I said. Now let's try it the other way around. What will happen here? Now we know what happens. We'll get an error. But the children did not understand that. They were like, why not? And I said, well, OK, think of, think of code as a story. It goes from beginning to end. You go line by line. You know? And one of the kids would interrupt me. They were very good at interrupting me and say, hey, Ramon, no, 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 hold on. Have you ever heard of one of those choose your own adventure books? In those kinds of books, you jump all over the place. How come we don't do it here? Honestly, I was stumped. But it taught me to appreciate that, something we take for granted. Is, code going down line by line or understanding that you can have to declare a variable before you use it is vital. I'll give you another example that I really like. See, after some time of doing some simple games, we would introduce the big shiny graphics. And they'd be like, OK, kids, here's your window. And this is how you position your character. It needs to have an x coordinate and a y coordinate. And I showed them, OK, so when, you, when both values are 0, the, your character will be at the top left. And the kid interrupts me and says, no, 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 hold on, hold on. See, the way I learned it in math is that it should be at the bottom left. Why are you guys making this so hard? I had no idea. OK, so I, and I told them. And, and one thing that's super important for me to remember is to embrace the fact that I don't know. Because there's so much that we don't know. Software engineering sometimes turns out to be a lifelong process of learning. And so I went home. I looked it up. I learned that these uh, old CRT monitors that make a big when you turn them on, they would um, render uh, screens by going from top left to left to right, and then one line down, left to right. You, some, there's a YouTube video that I highly recommend where they slow down a, one of these TVs, and you can watch it go, and it's mesmerizing. And I remembered, yeah, I really have to start taking a step back and remembering that I had to learn that once. I think we can all, I, could anybody please put up their hands? Does anybody have someone they know who uses, a, who uses you? as their Google. See a couple of liars in the audience. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, we all have one of those, and sometimes we'll get a little irritated and send them like, look, just Google it, please. But we forget, Googling is a skill. Searching for something is something that we take for granted. You know, it's so easy for us. A friend of mine always loves to brag about the one time she couldn't remember the word for monocle. She Googled that one eye thing. And Google said, yeah, here's a Wikipedia for monocle. We take that for granted. And it's important for us to take a step back and remember how we learned to learn. Because the best skill you can give someone in, a, in an environment of ever-changing technology is, your, is teaching them to learn. It's vital. Next up, sometimes when I'm doing a lot of projects, I find myself just wanting to be in a hurry to go from one thing to the next. OK, fix that bug, fix that bug. Feature shipped, let's go. So a little story. The kids and I, I would sit them down and tell them, OK, here's a new piece of technology you can use. This is an array. This is how it works. Here's how you can add stuff to it. Here's how you can remove stuff from it. Here's how you can go through each item in the array. So here's what I want you to do. Go and use it. And the kids would be like, what? I don't know how to use this. So what happened? Sure, I taught them how I introduced them to how it works, but I didn't really incentivize them to understand how it works. And the best way to understand something, just like any other skill for humans, is by practice. So, at the, so what we did after a while is we started giving them little exercises. Let's, do, let's make a few enemies. Let's make them all move this way. Let's make them all move that way. Let's destroy them all at once with a bomb. And so I would start every lesson with this. And at the beginning, I noticed there was some friction. The kids were like, come on, I just want to make explosions. And, 
what happened after a while is that it turned into a game for them as well. They wanted to beat me. They wanted to beat, you know, stop me before I could finish answering, uh, asking the question. And I thought, you know what? That's how I do it too. If I need a skill, I gotta keep going at it and someday I will be good. FYI, I can't draw. These are all done by other people. Now, this is a piece that I found, that I found much later in my career that was really, really aching for me how simplicity of code doesn't make it easy to understand. I'll give you an example, some more Ruby code. I've defined here a method that what it does is move the player five pixels to the right each time the game refreshes so that it looks like movement, right? And I showed this to the kids and they said, yeah, I understand this, this looks good. And I said, great, but hey, let me teach you a, a shortcut that'll knock your socks off. Bam, look at this, much nicer, isn't it? You define this as a shorter method, it's simpler, it looks nice, and the kid goes, actually, I, I, I prefer the one above. And the kids agreed with him. I thought, like, nah, it just must be that one kid, right? No, I got a majority telling me, I like this verbose code more. And I couldn't figure out why. It's so nice when you have a piece of code like this. This is beautiful, Ruby. You know, this is when you're moving your character to the right, to the left, sorry. Um, if it reaches zero, that is the left edge of the screen, it'll stay there. This is beautiful, Ruby. But sometimes you need a little bit of ver uh, verboseness. You need to have a little more structure in there to show that your code is also usable by other people because they might not know some of these shortcuts or they might be jumping in from another language. My final point for today is the importance of really taking a look at other people's code. See, as a freelancer, I don't get to do that that much. I only get to do that on myself. Later on, I've been able to work on bigger projects and you know, do code reviews and stuff, but at the time, that wasn't the case. So what would happen? Picture it. It's quarter to four, I've got 15 minutes left, nothing is working, all the kids are going, Ramon, 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 or big, 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 and I need help, and you need help. And so I'd be like, I'd go over and I'd be like, oh, come on, come on, you can see, the, you, why don't you look there towards the end? And they'd be like, I, I really can't see it. And I'd be like, okay, just this one time, I'm gonna fix it for you. So what happened? After a few weeks of this, when the kids encountered a problem, they'd just throw their arms up in the air and go, it's broken. Come fix it. I was appalled. I was, I was terrified. What had I done? Had I created a generation of lazy people? This shouldn't be the case. And so they just like take something like this and, uh, and just go like, it's broken. Uh, don't worry about the code. The point is it's broken. And so what I started doing, I thought to myself, okay, there we had, you know, you always have a couple of people who are a little faster, a couple of people who are a little slower. So what I started doing was telling the people who were done faster, hey, why don't you go help Vanessa over there? And Anna would go help Vanessa, and I'd, and I'd find that after a while, they were able to find these problems really quickly. And even after some time, they stopped asking me for help. They'd go to each other for help. They would sit down and work in teams. And I like to think of this as the sudden natural apparition of pair programming. <laughs> I was amazed. They naturally went towards that. And now they start telling me I'm reading so much code and I'm learning so much. And you can pick up tips from other kids, even from your students. I, I remember that. <clears throat> I remember that um, you know, I would teach them, I, I would introduce them to a, a, a programming uh, environment that I don't use in my daily work. I'm not a game developer, so I never really dug into it. And a few weeks later, I would be showing them how to do something, and the kids would start interrupting me and say, like, why don't you just use the sh keyboard shortcut? And I'm like, that exists? They started with that curiosity going deeper into the tools and figuring out what's what works and what doesn't. And I learned that not only is reading code great, pair programming occurs naturally. <laughs> and it's great. So, you know, aside from all of these things, what I really took away from teaching children to code was this big confidence suddenly came over me. I was able to present myself and make a fool of myself and everything would be fine the next day. So what happened afterwards, you might wonder? Well, I kicked back the tears. I grabbed my bag and I went to my first ever meetup and it was fine. I started volunteering, coaching people at 
events like Rails Girls. I would introduce people to programming, and it was fine. And here I am now. I'm giving a talk to you, and I'm fine. And I couldn't do that without a supportive community. I, having people around me is so important. And so what I want you to take away today is this incentive to teach people. Even if you think, like how I said this morning, I'm a beginner, what do I have to bring to the table? You have that beginner's perspective that experts are missing. You have unique insights that you can bring to the table and you will learn so much when they ask the questions that you never thought to ask. And that's not just programming, by the way, it's any skill. So I'm gonna wrap up now. I wanna thank my beautiful wife, Birgit, for doing the colored drawings. My sister, Pilar, who's here today for the for the black and white drawings, and I want to thank you, audience, for listening to me today. So if you have any questions, feel free to hit me. Thank you, Ramon. And let's have a look into Slido and the questions that are there. How can someone get started with teaching? That's a great question. Um, don't, I, I will give you some advice that I would have loved to give myself six years ago, which is don't just dive in head first. <laughs> Talk to people. There are, your community has teachers in there. There are events you can go coach at. There's not just Rails Girls, there's Rust Bridge, there's Rails Bridge, there's a Note School, I think. Um, Coder Dojo, there's all these places where you can volunteer and they have guides for you. They have written guides that are in parallel with what the students or attendees are doing. And you can follow that in parallel and you can fill in the blanks. It'll come naturally. But you have to take that step out of your comfort zone. I hope that answers your question. Good. Um, can you recommend some languages or frameworks to get kids started on code? Um, Sure. I mean, first off, it depends on the age, of course. Um, they, but don't think young. there's such a thing as too young is too young. Um, because, for example, uh, I, last year I learned that, uh, I, forget, I forget the name of the company, but they have this toy called the code a pillar code pillar And what it is, it's a, centip it's a caterpillar that you build, uh, you, you put each lump of the body together, and each of those lumps carries an instruction. So you can make it like, go forward for a minute, turn 90 degrees, turn 90 degrees again, go forward for a minute. It goes up, turns, comes back. And with that, you start teaching children the basics of logic. You, there's also a ton of games out there, free, on the web, such as Lightbot, which goes a little further into that. You have a little robot that you're giving specific instructions on how to get somewhere. If they're a little older, there's always MIT's Scratch, which is a great tool for younger children. I see someone who knows it. Yeah, and what's great about Scratch is that you don't have to write code. It's all drag and drop. It's kind of like you're building your code out of Lego blocks. And it's really cool because that way you can just, if, I, if you need a loop, you just drag in a loop block. If you need to print out something, you put in a printout block. And what's nice about that is that there's a lower propensity for typos, which are hard to find. <laughs> uh, a little older, you've got things like, uh, if, if, if you're building on top of, of uh, Scratch, I can recommend Stencil. Not free, but pretty good because it creates instant Flash games that you can try on your browser if it supports Flash. Um, there's also Unity. I know, I know, Unity is big and scary, but you can still introduce them to that. And with that, you can do a subset of JavaScript and introduce them both to game development and JavaScript. And what's nice about Unity is that you can make games in 3D pretty quickly. And they like that. <laughs> um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Thanks. Um, ah, interesting. Are you open to teams not based in Austria? I don't think this has to do with my talk. <laughs> <laughs> but this has to do with you. <laughs> Ask my wife. <laughs> She's studying in, in Austria. <laughs> Fair enough. So the answer is probably no. Okay. Um, yeah, we see you, you have a lot of energy and motivation towards the topic. So where do you get the motivation to do what you do? Where do I get do? my motivation? That's a... That's the first time I've been asked something like that, and now, whoever you are, you've caught me off guard. Um, 
I guess, you know, the great thing about, ah, I know, aha moments. Do you know what aha moments are? When you're stuck on a problem for hours and you, it, you finally understand the concept that you're stuck with, be it functional programming, be it um, uh, how, map, how map fun mapping functions work, something like this, when it clicks, you feel amazing, you are, you're on a rush, you're on an adrenaline rush, you feel like a genius, it's great. Or you feel relieved. <laughs> and see, getting, helping people get those aha moments, for me, is a huge rush. I wish I could do that for a living. So when you teach kids, they give you the aha moments? No, they have the aha <laughs> moments, and <laughs> I enjoy them. <laughs> ah, okay. Uh, same with coaching, by the way, seeing someone Seeing someone understand how an HTTP request works, for example, when they finally understand, um, you know what I mean by family, I, finally, it's not, anyway. Um, seeing how they understand how a request goes to, a ser to different servers and then reaches back to you and they understand and they go, oh, that's how it works and how you can recognize different devices connecting. Seeing that aha moment for me is a huge thing. Like the other day I did my first ever CSS grid and it, Like, it took me like two hours, and it worked, and I was like, wow, this is cool. I like that. Everybody does. <laughs> okay, uh, can you advise on how to start a learning group? Um, yes, and I can tell you that because my sister Pilar here did that, and what she did was talk to people. Find people who, in your community who are interested and talk to them or just, you know, even introduce yourself. Hi, I want to learn, start a learning group. How about you? You know, and, and you will find that the community is very, very generous when it comes to this, at least in my experience. I'm lucky, I know. But, you know, just, just talk to people. Um, But when, there's where a few... do you get the people? You just go on a square and... Greet everyone? I, I, well, no, I, ah, sorry, yes, of course, I'm taking this for granted, see? Um, go to meetups. You're gonna find a lot of like-minded people. Go to hackathons. You're gonna find a lot of like-minded people there. I hope that helps. Me too. Um, okay. Uh, how can we each follow adults? It seems like kids don't have pride, so it's easier for them. That's true. Ooh, yeah, no, that's, that's a good question. I mean, When you're at a workshop and there's adults there, you, we have the benefit that they are in the mood to learn, right? But if you're coaching, excuse me, if you're coaching someone who is a little, yeah, has this pride, has this difficulty, um, I find that putting yourselves at their level helps. And what I mean is, you know, you imagine yourself in their shoes and you imagine that you're frustrated because you don't understand this thing immediately, that this other person obviously understands. It's important to take a few step backs, be very patient, you will get there. Patience is its own virtue. But it's hard. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I hope that helps. Uh, have you heard of Roblox? Have you tried using it with your kids? Okay, so I've heard of Roblox, but only in memes. Um, so, online jokes, I, I know it's like a Lego-like thing, I have no idea. Is it like Minecraft or something? Something like that. I'm sorry, I, I, I guess not. <laughs> well, I mean, I've heard of it, but I don't really know what it is. Never So, mind. I will check it out. Thank you. And have you heard about the Hole in the Wall project? No, I have not. Uh, whoever submitted that question, I mean, come happily talk, to, I'll happily talk to you and uh, Amazing. Awesome. Uh, thank you. I'm going to repeat it for everybody who couldn't hear. Uh, in short, the hole in the wall project was invented by this man in India who was frustrated uh, that 
poor, poor children did not have access to technology. So he literally put a computer in the wall and invited children to come and play with it and learn and, and just toy around with it. And, it. and he found that this has helped them monumentally in their schooling. I hope I got that correct. So thank you very much. Thanks. And do you know Udemy? I, I know that it exists. <laughs> and you have to pay for it, right? No? Is it free? I don't know. OK, so they have some free stuff. Um, yeah, it's pretty good. My mother did a course with one of these platforms. I think it was Coursera. And she did like an HTML. She's a graphic designer. Um, and, she, and when I say graphic designer, I mean she was one in the 70s. And never really did much with computers. And then one day she said, I want to make websites. And I'm like, OK, you and I, we're going to sit down. We're going to check in every week and do this Coursera course. And she learned a ton. She made little, little videos, uh, sorry, not videos, websites dedicated to each of her dogs. It was great. And so, I mean, if Udemy is anything like Coursera, sure, absolutely. What I find helps is to do it in groups. You need, you need to get stuck with people. If you're stuck by yourself, you kind of feel like, am I? bad at this? Am I no good? But if you're with people, as of course, people that you're comfortable showing this vulnerability with, because it's important to be genuine. It's important to be honest and say, you know what? I have no idea how this works. I have no idea how React works. I do, by the way. I'm just saying. And they, <laughs> and they will help you not to give up, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You help each other. You understand things faster than they do. They understand, understand things faster than you do. So there's this collaboration. And it, it helps you become a team member as well, in my opinion. Very important. So I think that's it. That's it. So Ramon, thank you very much again. Thank you all.